this company that they were training helicopter pilots and mechanics. Okay. They were bringing them in in intervals. The mechanics would come in in two week intervals. The pilots would come in in 30 day intervals to complete their training and recertification. They had a prime contract to handle this training. We said, hey, we want to put them in a one bedroom so they can have their own space and do what they need to do. And so for our area was that GSA lodging per diem rate was 167 a night. So we said, hey, since they're coming in every two weeks, we're going to put them in two bed, two bathroom units. They can share the living and the kitchen as a common area. Right? That GSA rate per person was now 167 a night times two. So then those two bedroom units are generating $10,020 a month. So we have four of those. So between the five one bedrooms and the four two bedrooms, they're generating 65 k a month. With a five-year contract, it was another deal. So it was under the uh, Department of Defense, and it was the ATF specifically in Alabama. So then we were having trouble finding other Class A multifamily communities within this 10-mile radius. And so I taught my student how to do what's called hotel brokering. Long story short, he had two properties. Both of them said yes. So then we submitted the RFI. We submitted all this information. A couple months later, they circled back around. They turned it into an actual bid. He wins 7.5 million, 150 doors over five years. He's not dealing with checkout. He's not dealing with issues. The hotel's dealing with that. He's basically getting an invoice from the hotel and he's billing the government and he's sitting in the middle collecting the difference. What it is like to work with, not only just with the government, but it seems like you're also servicing someone that has a direct contract with the government. What does that relationship look like? There are some prerequisites that you want to have in place before you start going through that registration process. The government is pretty particular. So one of the things to keep in mind is they like experience. So come to the table with experience or put together a team that has the experience. But then after that, you'll want to make sure like, you're coming to the table as an entity. And that entity needs to be set up a specific way. So the government, they want to see a legit business address, a legit business phone number. They don't want to see a cell phone number. They need to have your own direct website and you need to have the professional email email accounts. So no Gmails, Yahoo's, anything like that. Those are important when it comes to setting your entity up as a vendor with Uncle Sam. And then it's even better if you've been transacting business for some time and you can show where you've generated some revenue. That even bumps you up a, a notch. Welcome to another episode of Affordable Housing and Real Estate Investing. Today, guys, we got a treat. Uh, we got a man with a big heart. We have Noble Crawford on the line today. And Noble... When I first talked to Noble, he shared so much about what he's doing, working with the government, working with the aviation space. And it's such a really unique, really unique space. And I've heard tons of great things from other people who have heard him speak at the conference. So I was truly, truly blessed that he gave me the time of the day. And I am so happy he agreed to come onto the podcast, man. Noble, welcome to the podcast, man. How are you doing? Man, can't, hey, I appreciate you having me, man. Such a, such a pleasure to be on. <laughs> well, Nova, for the people that don't really know you, tell us a little bit about your story, just like how you got into real estate and and the the amazing portfolio you have built so far. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, 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 like you said, my name is Nova. I'm co-founder of a hospitality brand based here in Texas, uh, and uh, along with my wife, and we've been in the space for. Um, almost going on close to seven years now. And uh, so that was really um, being in the short term rental space is really kind of our foray into into real estate, if you will. And so, um, you know, so we started in this space, um, uh, lease, leasing property initially. Um, and then as we scaled and grew our portfolio, then we started acquiring some owned assets and things like that. Um, and then we traditioned from just being really traditional kind of short term rental hosts to um, really just uh, being a hospitality company and uh, and engaging across a number of different verticals uh, directly uh, to uh, accommodate clients in our, in our properties. And so uh, so now I have the good pleasure of helping others in the space um, kind of scale and do do the same. So, man, so you started in short term rentals. So I'm assuming that's just like Airbnbs, right? That's what you kind of started out with. And then you became a hospitality company. And I love that you said that because you're starting to lay out a path for people, Noble, where they're like, hey, what does my career path look like? Everybody can own an Airbnb or two, but you started turning into a hospitality company. What helped you make that shift where you're just like, hey, we can do more. Like We're, we're so good at this. Like, What made you decide to go bigger? Because sometimes that's where a lot of people get stuck. They get one or two. They're like, yeah, I'm good. What was going on in your head? Yeah, no, great question, great question. So let me add a little context. Uh, so my my background going going pretty far back uh, was in the hotel space. I was in the hospitality space, 
And so a lot of people don't know that. So I've worked with all the big major brands. Um, I, I probably work for the majority of them at some point or another. Um, and so, so that's how I cut my teeth on the hospitality was that's, that's kind of where I started, you know, in my, in my twenties, if you will. And so, uh, so I had a, really kind of actually uh, had a defining moment that kind of shaped my entrepreneurial journey. Right. And so I'll just give you a quick story. So, uh, you know, so found out, um, some, some years back now, my wife, she was diagnosed, she had a brain tumor, right? She had a brain tumor. We had oh, to, to set it up, the surgery to go have it removed, this, that, and the other. Oh, and wow. uh, so set that up, uh, went in and they, they did the surgery. It was supposed to be like six to eight hours, it ended up taking like 14 hours, right? She oh. had to have a couple of blood transfusions and the whole nine yards, right? So she gets out, they remove the tumor. She's in the ICU, she's in the ICU. And the second day in the ICU, she flatlines twice, Right. And so um, so they they resuscitated her. Fortunately, they resuscitated her. She's still here with us today. But um, come to find out, long story short, she was allergic to morphine and they had her on a morphine drip post surgery no. it was killing her organs from the inside. Right. And so after that whole in incident and everything, she got released from the hospital um, some some time later. She had to rehab. Right. She had to, you know, and brain surgery is major. So you have to learn stuff all all over again, like bringing your spoon to your mouth, walking to the restroom on your own, the whole nine yards. So I had a decision to make in that moment. Hey, I'm going to uh, I'm going to stay home with my wife. Or at the time I was working at W2, I'm going to go back to my job and grind. And I was in a commission sales role. And so I, I elected to stay home with my wife. Right. And so like six to eight weeks later, whether she was getting around where she could operate on her own, I got called back into the, the office for a company wide like sales meeting. And in that meeting, I got just berated by the CEO, just ripped by the CEO for having dismal sales numbers for the previous six to eight weeks. Right. Never mind that everybody in the company knew what we were going through. Right. And so I made a decision in that moment, like I'm I'm going to I'm going to grind and work myself out of this job. Right. And, and so I and going forward, um, I hit a couple of large like opportunities that I got cashed out on. And I basically cashed out and left and never looked back. Right. And so that that pr prompted me into getting into entrepreneurship. I started a marketing agency in that same space because I had been in it for a while um, and that kind of took off. And then I was introduced to short term rentals. And uh, I was like, this, this looks even better than the marketing agency. And the marketing agency was running. It was doing fine. I had generated what it's called MRR, monthly recurring revenue. So as I stack clients, my revenue would grow, right? But I was working harder and more hours in that job as an entrepreneur than I was in my previous W-2, right? And so uh, when I found short-term rentals, I was like, you mean I can have monthly recurring revenue and not work as hard? And so that's how it all kind of came about. And it just kind of took off from there. Wow, what an amazing story, Novo. And uh, first of all, I'm so glad your wife is doing well and she made it out of that. Man, what that's a tough journey to be part of for the both of you. I can't imagine what you were feeling as a man, just like in terms of like, oh my God, like this is this is this is a lot. And for you to come out and I, I believe in karma and I believe there's a reason your family is doing well and and you have a kind heart, and I'm sure that has a role to play with it. So Man, thank you for sharing that story. That was so powerful. And I really hope the listeners can learn from what you share, Noble, because sometimes everybody waits for that moment, that epiphany, that moment before they say, hey, I'm going to make a change. You're you're so kind and being so open and transparent by sharing your story that you're hoping someone else doesn't ever have to get to that point to make that change. Yeah, I hope, hope not. Absolutely. Man. All right. Well, Noble, you have done a lot already. Tell us a little bit about what is what does your portfolio look like right now? Yep, absolutely. So right now we have uh, forty four uh, doors in our in our inventory. It's a combination of um, uh, leased units and owned assets as well, right? So um, so we primarily, like I was explaining earlier, we primarily cater. Um, to a number of different verticals. So, so corporate, healthcare, higher education, um, government, military, relocation, insurance, like all these different verticals. The difference is that um, we, we, while we started out using Airbnb, you know, because that was our beginning, kind of how we were introduced to the business, uh, we've graduated over time to where we 
are not dependent on them anymore. We rarely use them, right? And so, um, so a lot of our business is direct. So we've generated um, some direct contracts and things like we'll get into the government and the aviation stuff. Um, but it's enabled us to uh, scale um, considerably faster. Cut out the middleman. That's the Airbnb. Keep more of the revenue and the profit. Um, and so, so that's kind of where we're at today. Wow, forty-four units, and you own some, you lease some. That's pretty cool. Well, how I know we want to get into the government service administration, the GSA stuff today. Let's let's maybe let's just make it real for somebody, right? You have forty-four deals. Tell us about a recent deal that you've done that relates to the GSA or and that vertical, as you would call it, for that business. Yeah. So, so so caveat. Um, so when you're dealing with the federal government. Um, one of the interesting things that I, I like to explain this to people, one interesting thing to keep in mind is that the, when the government has a need, typically it's in bulk, right? Typically that needs, I mean, multiple of something, right? Um, and so it is no different in the space that we play, in, right? So when the government has a need for housing, for lodging, for accommodations, that's typically in bulk, right? Well, fortunately or unfortunately, like we didn't own an apartment community to just happen to sit in the right place exactly where they own this need. So we leased that inventory that we're leveraging for our government contract stuff. Okay. makes sense. Um, and then, but then like conversely in, in some other verticals, then we're using some owned assets. So for the government specifically, a lot of times it's going to be a lease play just because of the sheer number of doors that are needed. And that makes perfect sense. And maybe if I were to ask the first question is, um, it's a chicken or egg question, right? Do you get the unit first? and then go after the government client? Or do you know about a government client and then go after the doors? Tell us a little about that process. Like, What do you recommend for something like that? Yeah, great question. I love this question. So we've done both. Okay. So let me explain that real quick. So I'll give you a case study. I'll give you a case study. It'll kind of put a bow on it. So um, one, of the, one the first opportunity we went after. So I think it was year two. Year two in this STR business, I had this light bulb moment. And I'm like, wait a second. Why am I not leveraging what I learned in my previous W-2 and going after this government contract stuff in this business? It's it's just a different product or service that I'm offering now, right? But the process is the same, right? So then I went out and said, okay, I want to find like uh, I want to find a company that has a contract, um, you know, where there's a housing need, was a lodging need, right? So did some research, found a company that there was a Fortune 500 company. They were holding a defense contract on the D Department of Defense. Okay, now this company. Uh, they had their, their, the requirement of this, 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 uh, contract was that they were training, uh, pilots and uh, helicopter pilots and mechanics. Okay. Um, and they were bringing them in in intervals. The mechanics would come in in two week intervals. The pilots would come in in 30 day intervals to complete their training and recertification. OK. And so uh, once we identified that, we knew that all of these personnel were flying in on rotation every two to four weeks. Right. Um, to, to, the, to, to the local market that we were in. Right. In the Dallas Fort Worth area. And so we said, hey, we want to be in a position where we providing lodging uh, to these people alongside. Mind you, I have a hotel background alongside a lot of the hotels that were on the list that these people could choose from the Holiday and Expresses, the Fairfield Inns, all of that stuff. Right. And so um, so we identified the company holding the contract. Now, when a company has a contract directly with the federal government, it's called a prime contract. That means the contract exists between that entity and the government agency directly. Right. So this Fortune 500 company, they had a prime contract to handle this this training. This big DOD contract has a lot of moving parts up under it. One of those was the lodging component. OK, so what what we did was we said, hey, we want to be we want to offer our product for that, you know, for that need. And so um, so we were able to get in and here's how it works. Right. And this is where it gets really good. Um, so the pilots were coming in in 30 day intervals. OK, on, on rotation. And so because they were coming in 30 day intervals, we said, hey, we want to put them in a one bedroom. So they can have their own space, you know, and do what they need to do. They're, they're there for a longer period of time. Well, now we get into that GSA rate. So that so what what I know from my my, my previous line of work is that um, there is a federal lodging per diem that exists. Right. Um, when when in, in certain instances, when uh, personnel, federal personnel uh, are traveling on, on business for this purpose, it was training. And so that's the GSA lodging per diem rate, Government Services Administration. Anybody can Google it. GSA lodging per diem, put in their zip code. It's going to put it on there, right? And so what, what we knew for our area was that GSA lodging per diem rate was 167 a night, okay? That's huge. Got pilots coming in for 30 days, right? Pull out the trusty calculator, make sure I'm doing my math, right? I got it memorized. But 167 a night times 30, 
$5,010 a month, right? $5,010 a month for a one bedroom, right? Rent on a one bedroom is like $1,480, $1,450, $1,480, couple of hundred dollars in expenses. And the spread is what we get to keep. Mind you, we have five of those. Okay. Now here's where it gets, here's where it really got good. The mechanics were coming in two week intervals. They're rotating in and out every two weeks. So we said, Hey, since they're coming in every, every two weeks, we're going to put them in two bed, two bathroom units. They can share the living and the kitchen as a common area. Right. But because of that second bathroom that qualified that GSA rate per person at 167 a night times 30 nights was now 167 a night times two times 14 days. And then when we keep them full, that's 30 nights. So then those two bedroom units, yes, are generating $10,020 a month. And the rent is like two grand, a couple few hundred dollars in expenses. So wow. all collect, so, so we have four of those. So between the five one bedrooms and the four two bedrooms, they're generating 65K a month, month after month after month, right? And here's the thing. With these government contracts, these are long-term deals. This was a five-year contract. Wow. Right? We're, we're, we're in the, we're in like year three and a half. Right. And so, um, I like to tell people like when you land one of these, it's like the gift that just keeps on giving. Right. Um, uh, and so, so that's an example of us having inventory that we match to an opportunity. We love the thing so much. We said, Hey, we want to do this again. Right. Cause this is like super clutch. And so what we did was we found the opportunity. We, the next one, Still here in Dallas Fort Worth area, we found an opportunity, we went after it, we won it, and then we took the contract and leveraged it to go get the doors and get the inventory to support it. Okay. So that's a whole different conversation than somebody that's in Airbnb going into a community saying, Hey, can I Airbnb this one bedroom? As a at which point they're gonna say no. You know, uh, that's a whole different conversation when you're walking in with guaranteed federal money and you're saying, Hey, I need to support these federal personnel over this length of time and it's guaranteed money, right? Um Whoa. so you can do it both ways, yeah. Whoa, okay, but you started out knowing that you you found a company with one of these contracts. What did you even what did you Google? Man, did you Google like <laughs> a company with prime contract? Like, just tell us a little bit about that. Like, how? Because I really want listeners to walk away from this and say, "Wow, Noble helped me so much." Like, he gave me tactical steps about what I yeah. need to do. What What do you even Google in those situations? Yeah, like, yeah, good question. For? Good question. So, <laughs> so again, keep in mind my background, right? So, Correct. I literally kind of what I learned before. Now, here's the thing. Um, there's a couple of different ways, but one of my favorite uh, methods is a site called usaspending.gov, right? Mm. usaspending.gov, they show like historical awards that have been won over the past number of several fiscal years, right? And so you can go and you can dig and you can find those primes, again, companies that have a direct contract with the government, you can find those prime contractors in you know, within that mm. website alone, there's some other uh, options, but that one's rich, full of information, right? You can drill down and find those contract holders. And once you know who they are and the award that they won, then you can start to look for those, the synergy between what you're offering to, to the federal government and the, the awards that they won. And you're talking, and the awards that they won, are you looking specifically for contracts for like what you're doing? It's the mechanics and the pilots or what other sort of, awards might there be that requires lodging i guess is the better question yeah so good question so um so for me yes i'm looking specifically for stuff that falls under certain keywords or nax codes or, or what is what it's called um so i'm looking for stuff that falls under lodging or accommodations or even mm. hotels i'll put that in as a keyword right um wow. or or even housing sometimes right so i'm looking specifically for um opportunities that fall under one of those keywords Wow. Got it. All right. Well, then I really love that there were situations that meant both sides of the equation where you found an opportunity, then you got the housing or you got the opportunity first and then got the housing. Um, for the opportunity that you said you recently just won, did you have to submit like an RFP or something like that? Is that what you mean by you won that opportunity recently? So, um, so bo both of those opportunities I just uh, expressed, like we've been in those for a while. So not recently. Okay. We've been on them for a few years. So um uh the, the 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 first the second one, I actually found the um I found the opportunity through Sam, through Sam.gov. Sam.gov is a site that um uh that 
it's, it's like the database or repository, if you will, of contract award opportunities. It's also the same site that a company would go to to get registered to become a part of that federal database of vendors, right? Mm. Um, but then they post public bids and things like that through through that website. So it's, it's popular. Wow. Okay, great. Well, I love that you leveraged that contract with the opportunity to get the units from a property management company. Was that a pretty easy pitch then? Like, were there any, were there even any concerns? Cause it sounds like you just gave an alley oop and then they just had this freaking dunk it. Like, come on. Like, what? Yeah. yeah well, it, it, tell, it, it, what kind of objections it, do you get for when you pitch these things? Well, it's funny because um, they're not used to that conversation, right? <laughs> so they were perked up. You know, they were perked up, but because think about it, one is understanding, like, what are the pain points of, uh, you know, a, a multifamily property owner, right? Or a, a team of syndicators or whatever, like, what are their pain points? Well, occupancy is like, you know, you want to be at that 96 plus percent occupancy rate is as, as often as possible, right? And so when you're below that and you have available inventory, um, and then you, you, you understand, hey, I don't have to go through the steps of going out and trying to find find a qualified you know tenant take them through the application process verify their income credentials background all this and that right federal employees are some of the highest vetted um w-2 wage earners in the in the in the nation right um they get vetted on a whole different level just because of the nature of their job so for a property management company like you then you're listening because you're like okay so your client is going to be responsible for paying your client department of defense is going to be responsible for paying uh you know a long-term tenant stay you know over the course of three to five years and it's guaranteed money and it's a different conversation right so at that point they're very receptive to what you have to say and so it's not hard to close those oh man all right well this is starting to seem too good to be true. Tell, I mean, there must be some downside to the strategy. Is there like a lot of administrative paperwork? Tell us about what it is like to work with not only just with the government, but it seems like you're also servicing a for someone that has a prime contract, right? Someone that has a direct contract with the government. What does that relationship look like? Is there any complexities there? Yeah. So I'll tell you from out of the gate, like the most um, cumbersome part is that governmental red tape is going through that process of getting your entity registered and set up and stuff. Right. Going through that registration process through SAM. So there are some, um, you know, there are some prerequisites, if you will, that you will want to have in place before you start going through that registration process or it can slow you down or, or even hang you up. And so, um, you know, like the government is pretty particular. So one of the things to keep in mind is they like experience. So don't come to the table. You know, you just you just launch this, you know, janitorial company. You have zero experience. It's just you by yourself and you want to go get a contract. They're going to look at you like, what do you mean when you don't have any experience? So come to the table with experience or put together a team that you're going to come to the table with. And the team has the experience. Right. And so um, so that but then after that, like you will want to make sure like you're coming to the table as an entity. In some instances, you can do it as an individual. I don't recommend it, but in some instances you can. But if you're offering a service i.e. lodging, housing, stuff like that. You want to come in as an entity. That entity needs to be set up a specific way. So the government, they don't want to necessarily see a home address on your LLC or your, or your C-Corp, right? Um, they want to see a legit business address, right? So if you don't have an office, then you need to use a service, right? Like a like a Regis or a Da Vinci or an Opus or somebody has a building that you can rent space out of or that you could at the very least rent a mailbox from and have access to a conference room and things like that, right? So they want to see a legit business address. Uh, conversely, they want to see a legit business phone number. They don't want to see a cell phone number. They certainly don't want to see a Google voice number or any, any, anything like that. They want to see a legit business phone number. So you want to get set up with a, a grasshopper, a ring central, a dial pad. Somebody offers you a true legitimate business phone number. Usually those are have a P PBX kind of virtual system built into them. Dial one for sales, two for support, stuff like that. Okay. So a business phone number. Third, um, your, your website and your email, you know, you need to have have your own direct website your your dot xyz.com right and you need to have the professional email account so no gmails yahoos anything like that but you know an at dot xyz.com professional email account so some of those business 101 things that some people like take for granted don't think through all the way those are important when it comes to setting your entity up as a vendor with uncle sam so the red tape stuff like you need to get that stuff dialed in and then it's even better 
if you've been transacting business for some time and you can show where you've generated some revenue that even moves you bumps you up a, a notch but those are some of the things that you want to be aware of kind of going in because if you don't have them set up and take you a while to kind of get through that piece Wow. Those are super tactical steps. And I hope everybody is going to rewind that really quick. Take as much notes as possible. I don't know what you got to do, but make sure you have all these things in place because Nobo just saved you probably three, if not six months of your life from having to go through back and forth. Thank you so much for that. Dude, they must be loving this. I mean, if I'm a listener, I know I'm loving this right now. Nobo, you're dropping so much value right now. Well, uh, let's keep going on the tactical stuff because we're, we're going down this path anyways. When people are finding these opportunities, right? They found like, hey, those keywords that you mentioned, hotel, lodging, et cetera. And they find these companies with these contracts. These companies are pretty big. Who are you looking for? Are you looking for a contract administrator? Where, like, how do you even start in terms of finding the right person to talk about to offer the service that you're offering? Yeah. Yeah. Great question. Great question. So there's a couple of pathways, if you will. There's, there's more than a couple, but we'll, we'll focus on a couple. So you can, um, in the scenario that I described, um, we're positioned as a subcontractor, right? So the other company is a prime. Um, and then like with the, the pilots and mechanics, we're positioned as a subcontractor. Okay. Now when, so there's, there's the prime contract holders and then there's the subcontract holders who are operating up under a prime. Okay. Now when ideally where you want to kind of graduate to is being in a prime position where you have a direct contract mm. with the federal agency. Okay. That's kind of the sweet spot. That's where you want to get to, right? You can't, those opportunities are available, right? You, you can start as a sub, which is a little bit lower hanging fruit, a little bit, uh, a little bit easier perhaps, uh, but prime opportunities in this space, you know, in this housing, lodging, accommodation space do exist and they can be plentiful, right? Um, a lot of them are right there on that, that website I gave you, sam.gov, right? And so depending on which pathway or which avenue you pick would determine like who you need to get in front of, who the decision maker is, things like that, right? Um, and so some of these... Um, uh, some of these Fortune 500 companies, big companies, the Lockheed Martins, the the Raytheons, these big defense contractors and things like that, um, they have departments that will um, oversee um, the usually liaisons that are working with the federal agency on specific contract opportunities, right? And so they'll have like uh, the federal contracts liaisons that they work with. Um, they'll have some teams that are called SLED teams. Those are more state, local, and education based statewide teams that work on contract opportunities. And so, um, so part of it is being able to one identify who the decision maker is and then understanding how to get in front of the decision maker right so there is some prospecting and sales stuff that occurs right uh, but then once you're in the front of the decision maker you need to understand how to speak the language right so you need to understand the terminology is like for people that come from like if it's an example people that come from the airbnb space there's a totally different set of uh, a, a, a totally different language that we use in that space versus in the government space offering accommodations and lodging right so you need to understand how to speak their language right um and and and, and that's going to help move the needle now on the flip side if you're trying to become a prime and and they get involved directly with a federal agency where one of these opportunities exist um, then there's some a key important personnel you need to be in front of, you know, the contracting officer. Um, that could be one. That is the person that's solely responsible for the success or failure of that specific contract, right? Sometimes there can be more than one, but the contracting officer, um, there's usually a small business liaison that sits inside of that department of that federal agency. Those are good people to know. There's a uh, there's a um, an acronym, it's called OSDEBU, the Office of Small De uh uh, development business utilization. I'm probably messing it up, but Ozdebu, there's Ozdebu personnel. Those are worthwhile people to get to know. Almost every federal agency has an Ozdebu department and their job is to work with small business, small business owners like you and I to help get us in a position to win some of these opportunities. So those are people that you want to get to know, that you want to be in front of, right? And I think pr probably one of the biggest things to understand and even in the federal space, just like so many other different businesses, is very much relationship driven. You would be surprised. It's not always what you know that helps. Yes, most definitely. But a lot of it is who you know and the relationship that you built over time. And so you want to establish rapport with these key decision makers inside of these agencies. And they're humans, just like we are. People get nervous because they're federal. Don't. They'll pick up the phone. They'll respond to an email just like anyone else. You just got to reach out. So that's half the battle.
Uh, I mean, I can't stress enough the who, not how, right? And you have at least pull back the curtains right now, Noble, on the first step. And the first step is really to find these folks. So you talked about the almost like the procurement individuals in some of these corporations that you need to look at. You need to figure out uh, for some of these large companies, we're, we all know who Lockheed Martin is right now. It's not it's not a big mystery. There's only a couple of them that are that, are that big in this country. But the contracting officer, that's a title that I have not heard before. So that's going to be really, really key for people to figure out like, hey, who are the contracting officers for some of these opportunities? How do you get in touch with them? How do you bring value to them, uh, first of all? And it's a relationship. Thank you so much for highlighting that. Like sometimes people just think like, oh, I just got to submit a form and boom, that's it. That's it. It's like, that's usually not how it works. <laughs> yeah, no, not, not at all. I, I'll, I'll give you another tip too. So, uh, in on the on the federal side, like once once you get in front of a, a decision maker um, or somebody that can help influence you winning an opportunity or getting access to different opportunities, um, you want to um, you want to present to them kind of your business resume, if you will, right? Mm. So on the, on the on the on the government side, that's called a capability statement. Okay, a capability statement, in short, is just a business resume, right? Where you're um, you're you're, you're talking talking about so on that business re resume certain things will exist right uh and that's assuming you've gone through the process of registering your your entity through sam so when you register you'll get assigned two numbers you'll get assigned a cage code as a specific specific identifier that the department of defense uh issues and then you'll get assigned what's called a uei a unique entity identifier that's how the government recognizes you in their database so you get assigned a cage code and a uei you definitely want to have those two items on your business resume resume on your capability statement all your mm. company contact information your primary point of contact all of that stuff that we talked about address phone number email website all that good stuff but then you want to talk about like your uh, past performance right now again the government loves experience so you want to list all your past performance right whether that's from you directly whether that's members of your team combined whatever that looks like right you want to kind of list your differentiators or your unique selling proposition. Like, what are you offering to the federal government and what makes you stand out? So you want to have that on there. Um, if you've uh, graduated to the extent to where you've uh, uh, been, uh, you know, earned some certifications. So by that, I mean, there are certain socioeconomic certifications that exist, um, like dis disadvantaged business enterprise, woman owned inter enterprise, uh, veteran disabled veteran owned business enterprise. Those are socioeconomic certifications. If you qualify for those, definitely list those on your capability statement. That could be a huge step mm -hmm. up for you. Um, so you want to set up what's called a capabilities meeting with those decision makers to present yourself to them, to introduce yourself to them. Because the problem is one, they don't know you exist and they don't know what product or service you're offering. So you want to get in front of them and let them know. So then you can begin to nurture and build that relationship and learn about other opportunities that may not go out to public bid because they do award stuff directly without putting it out to bid. So you want to be in a position wow. to receive. Wow. That is a uh, big, big information yeah, like the, you got you guys got to pay attention to this stuff because that's usually how it works. Sometimes there are not everything gets put out on the market. Just like you have off market deals on real estate, these are the off market deals yeah. <laughs> for some of these contracts. Um, well, well, no, but you have such a large portfolio right now. How are you managing all of your portfolio to support all of these properties yeah, that you're question. running? Great question. So. <clears throat> Now, currently out of the 44, we only have three of them left on the OTAs. OTAs meaning online travel agencies, Airbnb, VRBO, Booking.com. We only have three properties left on the OTAs, and that's by design because of where they're located. So they're located in um, Arlington, Texas, near Cowboys Stadium. And they, they stay, they, this Cowboys, the Ranger Stadium is there, Six Flags. So they just stay, they stay big, booked and busy, right? So everything else is direct, right? And so, um, because it is direct, we're not dealing with the same type of guests that you would get through an Airbnb or booking.com, that transit guest that is coming, staying for two or three nights, leaving, right? Um, the cadence of our guests is spread out significantly further, typically 30 days or more. Right. So we're not sending in a cleaning team, you know, a couple of times a week to turn this property over and get it prepared for the next guest to come in. Right. It might be once a month, you know. And so um, so it requires you, you can operate more efficiently. It requires less resources across the board. Right. Because of the extended stay model, that mid midterm rental model, if you will. And so right now our team 
is made up of uh, what we call community managers. So our community managers are essentially kind of like um, our, our boots on the ground management uh, uh, folks, right? And so they manage the lead cleaners um, and the cleaning team under them, and then also the VAs. And they have a number of different responsibilities. They can basically do uh, just about everything myself and my wife can do in the business. And the only thing they don't really touch is the financials, right? Which we handle outside of that operationally and logistic wise, they can handle everything. Now we train them over time. So we brought them up, train them over time to where they, we could get to this place where we buy, buy, bought back our time freedom and we put the onus on them. Right. And so, so, so community managers, um, our cleaning teams and our VAs make up, uh, you know, make up our, our team, if you will. Now, um, Depending on the the use case of the property, again, we may send a cleaner in once a month. Uh, we may send them in once every two weeks, but that's the most frequent that we'll send someone in. And between them and our VAs, which are our virtual assistants, um, they're handling our guest communications. They're handling our, our interactions, you know, for any issues. They're communicating with the cleaners and with the uh, with the community managers. Um, we have our, our team, our people, we have our systems in place and we have our processes in place. And those three are the key, like defining things in this business that you need to have. You have your team, your processes and your systems. Um, you can automate so much of this to where you don't have to work in the business so much as on the business. So I focus on high level stuff, um, going out, looking for more inventory if necessary, yes. putting other deals together. Um, and then the community man managers, um, on occasion, if they have to, will answer to my wife. And so that's how we're set up. So very streamlined. Wow. Um, that is such a great operation and you guys have organized the work so well. You mentioned you're still going out and looking for inventory, looking for deals. Do your community managers help you look for those leads and, and more opportunities like that? Or your community managers just really specifically staying on top of, hey, I'm just here to look after the cleaners and take care of the existing customer base. How do you differentiate the work there? Yeah, they're primarily um, operations. Primarily Got operations. It. They come across something, they'll 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 let me know, but primarily operations. And so we uh we're 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 at a point now, and uh, oddly enough, we're in this 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 whole weird kind of economic climate, but we're at a point now where um our interest is more on the multifamily side. Mm. And so as things begin to kind of like normalize again, we're going to be heavily focused on on that. Um and uh and, and so that's where my focus is. Um that and then I'm also I work with a bunch of students and stuff and in, in education mm. side. So I engaged in that. Man, that is so cool. I mean, for, for people that are going to take your advice and go through Sam.gov and look at all these different websites, right? I think we talked about USA spending, right? USA mm -hmm. spending. Mm -hmm. yep. When they come across these opportunities and they, they're able to get in front of the right people, how do people partner with you? No, but can they say like, Hey, all those, all those things that you talked about, oh, you got to have an entity, you got to have a capabilities presentation, et cetera. Can they use you as their credibility to JV with you and partner with you? Like how do people best kind of team up with you and make you a winner? Yeah, good question. Good question. So um, one, one um, they they would need to be pretty pretty well seasoned, right? And so mm -hmm. um, so I, you know, it, it, for for me to partner in that, uh, you know, in, in in that type of scenario, um, I would be looking for someone who's um, you know been in their field for three to five years, mm -hmm. and, you know, has revenue metrics that they're hitting, you know, at at a, at a certain mark, um, you know, for it because uh, if I'm going after something, if I'm using my time to to go after something, it's it's, mm -hmm. it's I got to put my best foot forward and my strongest right. foot forward. And so my partner needs to be as strong as I am, you know? Love it. Um, and so, so that's what I would be looking at if I were looking to partner uh, on some opportunities of, of which I am, um, but that's the caliber of a person that we're looking at. Um, that said, um, if someone is registered in Sam, they've gone through that whole process, they're in the database. Now they're starting to look at opportunities. Um, then, what they can, one of the things that they can do is they can look for uh, inside of Sam, they can look for what are called a source of salt or mm. another name is a RFI request for information. So mm. a source of salt or RFI is when a federal agency has a need for something, but they're doing their market research to see how viable it would be to, you know, be able to fulfill that, that specific need. So as an example, in this housing space, and this is a case study too, recent mm -hmm. student. So working with a recent student, um, 
the identify a uh, source of salt opportunity. It was for um, the, uh, the it was another DOD deal. So it was under uh, Department of Defense um, and it was the ATF specifically. They were looking for a number of doors in Alabama. They were looking for uh, uh, I forget how many, but they were looking for doors in 50 unit increments in Alabama. And they were bringing people in on rotation for weapons training. OK. And so uh, so they and they were bringing them in groups of 50. And so and, and they needed to stay for like a week or two. OK. And uh, so they needed uh, they, they put out a request for information or a sources salt um, uh, uh, you know, thing on Sam. And they said, OK, this is the criteria that we're looking for. We're looking for somebody who can provide minimum of 50 doors, has to be within 10 miles of this military base. So then this 10 mile radius, um, it's got to have meet these specific criteria of amenities for the property, this, that and the other. So we recognize that that was our opportunity. Now, a, a source of sought or request for information is not the same as a bid or a solicitation. That's when the government's saying we're taking bids now. We're going to award it. A source of sought or a request for information is simply them saying, hey, we're doing our market research and due diligence because we have we think this could turn into a bid opportunity. OK, however, don't sleep on an RFI or a source of salt. So we responded to the RFI and source of salt. And here's what we did this is where it gets clutch. We identified um, we identified a multifamily development community that was in phase three construction and they were sitting on all this available inventory. We said, look, we want to partner with you guys. So my student, he want we want to partner with you with, with you on this endeavor. We're working, trying to land opportunity with DOD. We need 50 doors, one bedrooms, all this criteria. And it's going to be five years. We need them. That's a, diff, a different conversation, right? So they were like, let's do it, right? So they submitted it. They wrote it. We drafted the LOI. They said, yep, we'll partner with you. Should you win? So then we said, okay, we were having trouble finding other class A multifamily communities within this 10 mile radius. And so I taught my student how to do what's called hotel brokering. Okay. Now here's the thing. Remember my background is in hospitality, right? So hotel brokering, essentially you going to the hotels and saying, hey, uh, there's an opportunity that we are working on through the government, uh, we would like to um, get access to your available inventory, X number of doors, 50 door minimum for this length of time. Is that something you'd be interested in partnering us with, right? Long story short, he had two properties. Uh, there were franchise properties that they were flagged properties. One was a Fairfield Marriott. The other one was a, a Courtyard Marriott. Both of them said yes, right? So they each said, we'll put up 50 doors. So then we submitted the RFI. We submitted all this information. This is These are the options we're going to present to you if this becomes a thing. A um, couple months later, they circled back around. They turned it into an actual bid. Okay. They actually reached out and said, we like what you're, you know, we, we here's the bid. We want you to bid on it. So we worked through the bid process, submitted the bid. He wins 7.5 million, 150 doors over five years. <laughs> Whoa. Okay. So, so in that scenario, he will get 7.5 million, but then obviously the, the providers of the housing, the multifamily, and then the hotels, they get their rate and he will probably just make the arbitrage in between, right? For brokering that, that deal. That's how people make money on these deals. Absolutely. Now, remember what I was explaining earlier, that GSA rate. So then when he looks at the GSA rate for that area of Alabama and he's able to calculate that and then he looks at the rent, he was able to negotiate with the multifamily community for those 50 doors for five years. That spread is stupid. It's a stupid spread. OK, and that's 50 doors. I, I had nine. He's got 50. OK, so that spread is crazy. Then here's the beautiful thing with the hotels. OK, his spread is not nearly as high, not nearly. But here's the thing. He's not dealing with guest check ins. He's not dealing with housekeeping. He's not dealing with laundry, linens, and towels and all of that stuff. He's not dealing with checkout. He's not dealing with issues. The hotel's dealing with that. He's uh, uh, basically getting an invoice from the hotel, and he's billing the government, and he's sitting in the middle collecting the difference. So he's Got not it. doing anything but collecting that spread. So that's that's passive. It doesn't get any oh, more passive. Man. That's, that's like a very yeah. small administrative yeah. responsibility right exactly. there. Exactly. So that's how I set up. Yeah. Wow. Well, Noah just dropped seven and a half million dollars of value for everybody on his podcast. This is the multi-million dollar podcast. This is why everybody listens to this. And to make sure you guys got to follow Noble. Um, Noble, we got about 15 minutes left. I want to be respectful of your time, but I, I know we want to talk about aviation. So we went through this, man, multi-million dollar value, man. I, my 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 jaws can't like 
you saw my mouth dropping. It's crazy. Uh, but let's talk about aviation, pilots, flight attendants. You taught, you gave us so much advice on how to look for those relationships on the government side. How can people look for opportunities like this on the aviation side? Yeah, good question. Good question. So this this uh, specific vertical is is more new to us. So we're only doing it a little over, little almost eleven months now. But um, we kind of fell into it, right? So <clears throat> on the aviation side, um, my I have a cousin, I have a cousin who's out of Florida, and he got uh, he was applying to get on with Southwest Airlines. And so he had to do his training in Dallas here where I'm at. And so he goes through his whole training and everything ends up, um, you know, graduating, getting his wings, all that good stuff. And uh, he ends up getting stationed in Dallas. And uh, and so, you know, a couple, couple months later, I'm, I'm like, well, where are you where you've been staying? You know, because he has a place in Florida. And he's like, oh, I'm staying in this crash pad. And I was like, crash pad, what's that? He was like, well, it's basically like temporary housing for all of us, you know, flight attendants, you know, that are that, that live here, you know, stationed here, but don't live here. And, and so then, I, of course, I the space I play in, I have a light bulb moment. I'm like, tell me more. Right. And so so long story short, in the aviation industry is very common. Like this goes back for decades. I didn't know this. Right. And I used to work for an airline for a stint, but I did not know about this. So in the aviation space it's very common when flight attendants and pilots get hired onto an airline, um, their seniority is at the very bottom. Right. And so they have to they have the list three places they would they would like to be stationed, their their base of operation that they fly out of. Right. Usually they're going to list their city of residence where they live as number one. More often than not, that's not the one they get selected for. Right. It's usually doctor option two or three. In this case, because my cousin, he had, you know, Tampa was one. He had another one. He had Dallas um and he he got dallas right and so because he doesn't live here he still needs a place to stay um in between working his active route so if you understand the aviation business what here's how it works so for flight attendants um they will work like their active working schedule um it could be like it's got it'd be like 21 days uh it'll be anywhere from like 14 to 21 days out of the month right they have to hit a certain number of flying hours active hours right um the rest of that time is downtime they're off right so they could be they could have downtime that could be like 12 to 14 days it could be 10 days right it could be some somewhere in there and so when they have that downtime they need a place to hold up they need a place to sleep and stay and so that's where crash pads come in so that's an industry term i didn't come up with it that's the term they've been using for decades crash pads well essentially it's a kind of like a hostel it's a hostel model so there are multiple beds in a bedroom typically bunks there's usually two bunks to a bedroom and then they have the shared uh living and kitchen area right and so when i so when he told me about that i'm like oh i need to come see what this looks like <laughs> you know and so i went out checked it out i was like oh this I'm definitely fixing to do this. And here's why. Um, the property that they were staying in, in my opinion, now granted, I'm from the short-term rental space. In my opinion, the property was trash. It was terrible, right? It was used furniture. It looked like somebody went and picked up something off the side of the curb that somebody else was putting out. Um, you know, it was not in very good condition. Um, they didn't supply anything to them other than a mattress and a, and a, and a bed, top bunk, bottom bunk, right? And access to the bathroom. Um, like zero amenities, very vanilla, used furniture, condition is just subpar. I'm like, first of all, I was shocked. And then I'm like, oh my gosh, we could do so much better than this. And this is what I, this is what I learned. So they pay per month per bunk. Okay. But they don't, they're not there the entire month because they're out flying their active routes for at least two to, you know, anywhere from two, two and a half to three weeks of that time period. And when they're out flying their active routes, then they're in a layover situation where they're staying at hotels overnight between layovers. Okay. What we're providing in the crash pad play is that other uh, housing that they need when they're not out working their active routes. Same for pilots, pilots and flight attendants, the same. Okay. So then we know, okay, we're charging by the bunk. So we said, okay, let's do this. So we got a four bedroom property and we said, we're going to charge $500 per bunk per, you know, per, per month. And it sleeps 16 because there's four bedrooms, there's four bedrooms, three and a half baths and it sleeps 16. Right. So do the math, the $500 a month, that's 8k. Yeah. Yeah. So then we got your mortgage and all of that stuff and expenses and insurance tax, all that good stuff. That spread is stupid, right? The spread per per property is, is dumb. And then um, rarely do you find a situation where everyone's there at the same time because the majority of the time they're out working their active routes. So there may be four people there at one time, seven at another, two 
you know, it just, rarely is the property just full. They're not on top of each other like that. And so this is a model that the industry is accustomed to, that flight attendants and pilots are accustomed to. It is not brand new to them. It was more brand new to us. But then when we said, hey, we're going to come in and provide a superior product than this trash property over here. And we're going to do a bunch of things differently that we do in the STR space. It just took off. And so then we got a second one, we got a three bedroom property. Right. Um, and now we're looking for some more. So that's the beautiful thing I love is it's very easy cash flow. Our cleaner goes in once a month. She, she, we provide linens and towels and stuff. Most of them don't. Right. Most of them, those properties crash pads, you can, the flight attendant or pilot can only bring one piece of luggage with them. That's it. Oh, wow. Right. We provide stores so they can bring whatever they need to. Right. We provide blackout drapes. We provide free coffee and tea. We provide stuff that we would do in a normal STR situation. Mm. That none of these other crash pad providers are, are offering. Additionally, what I did find that was common is that these crash pad owners putting interior cameras in the property. Yes, it's crazy. Yes, I, you can't make this stuff up. No, no stop. Yes. That's so, so when, weird. So oh when I God. found that out, I was like, yeah, there's no way in the world we're doing that. Like no cameras on the inside. One at the front door, one at the rear, no cameras on the inside. So then that automatically solves the pain point because the female flight attendants, if it's two o'clock in the morning, they want to go to the refrigerator in their nightgown. Like that's creepy, right? You got a camera right there in the kitchen. Like who does that? So oh we're like, we're God. not doing any of that, right? Um, but, but we charge a premium, but we have all the amenities there, right? The storage space, we provide the linens and towels and all this and that built in washer and dryer, two refrigerators and two freezers, right? Because of the amount of people. Um, so the whole nine yards. Wow. So that's why we love that space. I mean, you're just getting started in this, but you are already providing an elevated product, elevated experience. You're 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 making everybody look good, right? The person who found your home is going to be like, "Oh, these flight attendants, they love me because they found this amazing place for me." Uh, well, actually. Who are you reaching out? Like, how did you even get in touch with the company? Is it like a contract officer, not a contract officer, but somebody else that's of a, well, I don't know. You, yeah, you tell yeah. me. Good, great question. Great question. That's probably one of the number one questions I get. So um, in, in the case of the person, so because he was a flight attendant working with the airline, um, it was very easy for it to spread word of mouth, right? Especially with what he was staying in versus then what we put together. Like that became very, and, and then there's a lot of them. This is not like a small demand type of thing. This is a huge demand. It was like a, a shortage. And so word of mouth was like the biggest thing. But then, you know, I had my cousins working on the inside, right? So, but then going forward, like I found like there are uh, crash pad groups on Facebook, for example. Right, where you can get in and list your property and things like that. There are websites. There's a couple of websites, not 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 very many. There are a couple of websites where you could list your property, but the properties on there are not great at all. <laughs> so you can stand out very easily, right? Um, if like I'm here in Dallas Fort Worth area, and so uh, American Airlines headquarters is here, okay. And so um, so if you can get in front of the flight training team, the flight training instructors, and things like that, and present your your, your, your business proposition and your, and your opportunities to newly graduating classes, which is what I'm working on right now, that's a game over type situation, right? Um, so there's a lot of opportunity in the space because um, one, the product is inferior, the existing product. Number two, um, the demand is greater than the supply, right? Uh, and some of these folks find themselves in situations where they have to stay at hotels. And that can be ridiculously expensive, like way more than a five hundred dollar a month bed and a crash pad, right? And then, and then so, and then some of it is again, like we talked about earlier, developing those relationships. So now, if I'm on a plane, right, uh, I'm having a conversation, right? You know, especially if I'm flying out of a base airport. Um, and so, um, so I haven't got the whole marketing piece dialed in yet. I'm still working on that myself. Uh, but there's a number of different ways to kind of get plugged in. Oh, I lost you. I lost your audio. Oh, sorry. I, I was on me. I was so excited. I forgot to unmute myself. That's what happened, man. Um, but I think there's just so many opportunities here. And I think now people that are listening to this have no more excuses. You kind of have to just pay attention. Like if you're on a flight now, you have to talk to the flight attendant after what Noble just told you. You have to. You have to figure out. Like I have properties in Scottsdale, and Noble, you and I talked a lot. Um, like I'm, I'm in the real estate development world now, and really, I have a couple of Airbnbs. And honestly, I'm willing to settle for lower revenue if that means I get all my time back from not having to manage people checking in and checking out every single weekend. So I might look into this because this is, it's in Scottsdale. That's a big American Airlines hub. 
why not look for yeah. flight attendants that might love? Because sure. I know I have a really, really super elevated property in Scottsdale with a pool. So I think people would right. love that. Yeah. Now here's the thing. Uh, the, the, the revenue com- can compete with short-term and midterm rooms. All right. So f- for example, on your four bedroom, cause you can sleep 16 for four in a room, you know, at $500, that's 8k a month. But even on like an insurance booking or other midterm rental strategies, you may or may not get that amount. Right. Um, on a, th- on a three bedroom, you'll be looking at like 6k a month. Right. Um, and so the spreads are still there. Um, the, and, and, and then, like you said, like, uh, operationally, uh, logistic wise, like there, the, there, there's uh, s- significantly less to do to manage the property. Um, and here's another point I'll make the, um, the flight attendants and pilots, they're accustomed to self-managing. Okay. Mm. I found that there was a thing. So typically they'll designate a senior personnel type person, like who's ever senior in the property to be kind of like, um, like a house mom, if you will. So like a senior flight attendant and sh- they, they will dictate everything down to, um, who's responsible for cleaning what on which days, you know, through chores and stuff like that. So they, everybody's pulling their weight collectively. That's they self-manage inside of the property and they become like a small family. They get to know each other. They all work in the same space. A lot of them for the same airline, some for different, different airlines. Um, but that's just something they're accustomed to doing. So that's why we only send our cleaner in once a month to restock and to deep clean the kitchen and baths. Outside of that, they self-manage. Wow. I mean, this is just such a great opportunity. I mean, as you were talking about all this, Right, no boy. Like I, right. This this podcast is called affordable housing because one, we want to show people how to work with the government, which you showed tremendously with amazing amount of value in the beginning. But for me now, I might look at well, maybe there are hotels and motels that I can convert to affordable housing for refugees, for the homeless. I don't know what that might look like, but I that's where I, my head's going right now, Noble, because I want to go on this website and say, hey. Where are those opportunities? Are there any RFIs out there right now for folks that they're looking for temporary housing for people? Because I know in my hometown of Boston, they're out of space. There's no more space in the shelters. It's crazy. Yeah. But I, now I'm curious. Now you're you're making the light bulbs go off in my head. Like, let me go and figure out one, are there opportunities here? Not only from a monetary standpoint, but how can I help people, truly, yeah. truly help people and take down some of these properties, but have a government contract in hand to make my investors feel a little bit more at ease. Man, Noble, this has been so, so valuable. Thank you so much for coming on here, man. Yeah, wow. man. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. This is so cool. Hey, Noble, for people that... Well, let me, let me pause there. Usually I ask this question to everybody. I'm curious to hear your perspective. I, I always ask this one question. Why do you think affordable housing is so hard to solve for? Any, any ideas do you have about that? This is something I ask everybody because I'm trying to collect pieces of the puzzle, man. Everybody has a different perspective. And I think eventually we're going to solve this problem all together. Yeah. Well, <laughs> first of all, that's a great, a great question. I'm not sure I have an answer to it, but, um, you know, I, I think there's a number, a number of different reasons that well, I, I can speak from like my angle. Um, you would great. be surprised. You would be surprised at um, how many jurisdictions and municipalities blame uh, quote unquote Airbnbs on affordable housing, um, you know, uh, 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 you know, contributing to the affordable housing problem, if you will, right? And uh, the research says otherwise, right? The research says otherwise. Um, it, but it, it, it's funny because um, you know so, some you know some some cities look 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 down on it and they're beginning to heavily regulate it, right? Uh, but I think you know, um, quite frankly. Um, if you look at the trends, especially over the last five to seven years, when you see like the, the black rocks and, and, and other, like, uh, you know, big, big, big investment guys, um, buying up full neighborhoods, you know, and and things like that. Um, and, you know, jacking the rents rate up, you know, way up and things like that. Like, I think that, that definitely has a contribution. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I would even say even more so that, you know, than what we do in my space on the, on the Airbnb side. And so, but I think it's multiple things. Um, and, 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 and man, if y'all are working on a solution, man, I'm all for it. Hey, I think this is such a, a massive problem. And this is why we have this podcast where we bring on everybody on here for different perspectives, because with a large problem, you need a large team and tremendous amount of discipline to solve this problem. And I love that you brought up the Airbnb supply thing because I followed this other guy. His name is Logo Motoshami, uh, one of the lead analysts for Housing Wire. And he has like busted this myth about 
Airbnbs being the the reason for lack of affordable housing. He's like he, he's like even if you take the entire supply of U.S. Airbnbs and put them on the market, you're still short in inventory. So it's not the problem. Uh, I'm so glad you brought that up because sometimes uh, people read he- news headlines more than than actually looking at the actual data to support where everything he says. Um, well, Noble, I know we're at the end. Tell the people how they can find more about you and how can they work with you. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, first of all, Kent, man, hey, I, I, man, I appreciate you for having me. Uh, this has been so much fun. I love talking about this stuff. Uh, for people that want more information, the easiest way to reach me, quite frankly, is just on Instagram. Um, you know, uh, just, you know, hit me up in the DMs. I check all my own DMs. You know, I'm not that guy. I'm not so large that I don't check my own messages. So, so just hit me there if you have an interest in getting more information about, you know, kind of what I'm doing and how you can do it as well. Um, I do, I have a couple of coaching mentorship programs that I offer for people that are interested. And, um, yeah, man, I appreciate it. All right. And your handle is noble.crawford, C R A W F O R D dot three, the number three. Noble.crawford.3. Cool. All right, guys. Make sure you guys give Noble a follow. If if you don't follow him, you're missing out on millions and millions of dollars of value. I I can't like go follow him. I when I first heard about this guy, I checked him out, have a conversation with him, and I was blown away by how nice of a guy he is. And I hope that the amount of information that he gave away on this call today truly shows what a nice guy he is. And that's why his family deserves all the best karma in the world. And Noble, thank you so much for coming on here, man. I'm so I'm so glad I get to meet people like you who are so open and transparent and giving. Like without people like you, like I'm pretty sure I would have never had the home I grew up in because it's people like you that are so open and giving that really pays all the good karma forward to everybody else. So thank you so much for coming on here, man. I, I had so much fun talking to you today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Man, my pleasure. My pleasure. I appreciate it. All right. And we are out.